Cafe Writers. Before we get to today's interview, I wanted to give a quick shout out to a couple of listeners. First, I wanted to say thanks to Tammy, a longtime listener who recently donated 10 bucks to the podcast via buymeacoffee.com slash MFA Writers. Thank you so much for your support, Tammy. And also thank you to Brian Storm 318 who recently left a review of our show on Apple Podcasts. Brian wrote, Useful and thoughtful. I found this show through a Reddit thread and am so grateful. I have been figuring out which MFA programs to apply to, and I couldn't have asked for a better resource. Jared is a present and engaging host, and the guests are bright and honest with their responses. And check out the George Saunders episode for a great conversation on writing. Thanks for that review, and good luck to all of you who are applying to programs with deadlines this month. We wish you all the best. You can find MFA Writers on Instagram and Twitter, as well as MFAWriters.com. We love to hear from listeners, so feel free to shoot us a direct message on one of those platforms or an email at MFAWritersPodcast at gmail.com. And if you have a minute to rate or review the show, the best place to do that is on Apple Podcasts. Doing so will help boost our podcast as we try to boost these amazing writers. Also, if you or someone you know would like to be a guest on the show, you can apply at MFAWriters.com. On that same website, you can also click the support button to support us financially, if it's within your means. Or you can do so by going directly to buymeacoffee.com slash MFAWriters. Finally, as always, thank you for listening, and we hope you enjoy the episode. Welcome to MFA Writers, the podcast where we talk to creative writing MFA students about their program, their process, and a piece they're working on. I'm your host, Jared McCormick. Today I'm with Caitlin Airy. Caitlin is a Korean American poet. Born in Minneapolis, Minnesota, she was raised in the San Juan Archipelago off the coast of Washington State. In spring 2020, her poem Demilitarized Zone was selected by Elizabeth Austin as the winner of the Phyllis L. Ains Contest sponsored by the Skagit River Poetry Foundation. In 2022, Narrative Magazine named her one of their 30 Below 30. Her recent work has been featured or is forthcoming in Ecotheo, Crab Creek Review, Cream City Review, Moss, Post Road, Poetry Northwest, Palette Poetry, and Narrative Magazine. She's an MFA candidate in poetry at the University of Virginia, where she serves as the editor-in-chief of Meridian and as an editorial assistant for Poetry Northwest. Today, she's going to read a couple of poems for us. DMZ. Not border, but what is for holding. Not men, but what is for killing. A grove of trees, deep green wounds, ruination, or washing rice in graves. Grandmother, I never knew. Grandmother, promise me a measure of night. Wind blown through open hands will graze your heart. Tell me when you feel a cold mirror. Tell me you held your daughter just once. Not oath, but intention. Not mother, but a vessel of brine. Not caught, but a bed of hyssop. Banter of bees. This bitter cup. This rash of weeds. This fallow field. This feeble daughter. This green plum, which falls like a shade. Which is for cold which is for not knowing. Grandmother, your absence blooms across hours of sleep, and somewhere west, a red-winged woman waits the dark hair you gave her, polishes her mirror like a gun, which is for hurting, which is for being seen. Not old country, but what is for ghosts. Not hangul, but what is for anguish. Not mother, which is for daughter. Not this girl, which is for spoils, which is for charity, which is for Christian family, which is for America. Not war, not war, not war, not war, but what is for saving, or so they promise, or so they tell me. This next one is called, The Sparrows Keep Hurling Themselves Against the Window Panes. The sparrows keep hurling themselves against the window panes, so I place their bodies in dark boxes to soften the shock of it, and still it is summer, and each day the sun arouses the kudzu in a slow act of violence against the porch 
where we rapidly closed in on a false sense of intimacy, candy-colored and frantic, and I could keep undressing him deeper and deeper in this way, like peeling a blood orange, pulling at bitter threads for that burst of bright sugar. But when he tells me he's unwell, I know I should believe him. And still he smells of camphor and night-scented tobacco, like there's a touch of medicine about him. And when he feeds me sliced apples from the flat edge of his father's knife, whose heart swelled and burst between smoke-inflamed lungs, I take whatever he offers. And when he clutches my throat and squeezes, I can't tell you if I'm reliving something awful or if I just want to be thoroughly fucked. I can't tell you why when my dark hair is done drinking up the night that he grabs fistfuls and it reminds me of that field I cleared of dandelion roots and sumac, though I will say that when we held hands in the alley light while watching a coalition of birds sweep upward in a dark spire, I felt some tenderness, like there's something soft and feral in the way we collide in my unfurnished room. And it's true that we could cover the windows each morning. And yes, yes, it's true. Sometimes I want the apple. Sometimes I want the knife. Caitlin, that was great. I love your poetry. It was so nice to hear you read it. Thanks for being here. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. So as I mentioned, the first poem you read, Demilitarized Zone, was a contest winner. Um, and it's incredibly deserving. It has some like really beautiful language and imagery that gives it such heart and energy. It also encapsulates many of the subjects that you say drive your work, namely your experience as an adoptee. So I was wondering if you could tell us a bit about your upbringing and why you think being an adoptee has become what you call an obsession in your work. Mm, Thank you so much for that question. Um, Yeah, I mean, it's it's absolutely shaped my identity in ways that are really hard to articulate. Um, And I think part of that attempt to articulate has come from like through writing Mm -hmm. and um, the sort of a a circling around the subject, um, looking at it from many angles. And um, as far as my upbringing, my my story is a little unusual because I I am adopted, but I was adopted within the States and my, um, my birth mother is also adopted, but from South Korea And she was left at the, on the doorstep of an orphanage in Seoul with no identification um, of any kind. So that poem that I just read was in a way like me trying to write to this grandmother figure that, you know, I know nothing about her. She might be out there right now. She could have passed for all I know, but a lot of my work um, writes into that not knowing um, and that lost lineage. Yeah. I mean, You told me before the interview that you're particularly interested in exploring abandonment in your work, whether it's by the parent, the lover, or by God. That last one you put a little question mark next to, like you weren't really sure about yourself. So I'd I'd love to hear you talk about that and, and how you've seen that root obsession with being an adoptee morph into other areas of exploration in your work. Right. Yeah. I mean, yeah, God, it's a big subject. (laughs) Not sure if I can take that one on, but I, I feel like what I've what I found in my work is that I am really concerned with themes of abandonment, which I feel like is such a key part in like the healing process of being an ad- adoptee. You know, your life starts with abandonment. You may go to a loving home afterwards, but the beginning of your life is marked by that abandonment. And, you know, it's just something that I, I think a lot about and, um, you know, not to get all Freudian, but I'm very interested in attachment theory um, I, I find myself really writing in the vein of like Eros, um, where there's like a absent beloved. And I, I feel like that fits very much into writing about my, my grandmother, who I'll never meet. But also, I think that is just an emotional realm that my poetry lands in quite often. And I generally like find that, you know, there's something spiritual about writing about abandonment as well um, because of the human condition. Mm -hmm. Um, And so right now I'm trying to push my work more into that, that area. And you mentioned healing. I'm curious if you find that writing aids in that healing. And if so, like when did you first realize that writing was helping you heal in some way or work through these things? Well, I think a big part of my writing um, involves research and a big part of the healing has involved trying to connect with a culture that feels lost to me. 
So um, look, researching the Korean War, which I feel like has shaped the trajectory of my being here, is something that, you know, isn't fun all the time, um, but has given me some answers and some possibilities, some threads to follow when it comes to this unknown lineage for me. And um, writing is a way to respond to that research. So a good example of that is I found this photograph. Um, I want to say it was in the University of Hawaii archives. Um, and there were these photographs taken by an American GI. One of them in particular stood out because it was a picture of a three-year-old orphan. And she was sitting in an orphanage in, an, in a bed made out of ammo boxes. Oh, wow. And... Yeah. And the title was Cozy in My Bed. And it was not meant to be ironic. And things like that haunt me. And I wouldn't say that doing this research is necessarily healing, but something something's happening there for me when I do it. And writing is a way to circle around those questions, some of which can't be answered, but I think um, help me understand a little bit more about who I am. So what do you think it is about the Korean War that draws your interest? Well, you know, I think what draws me to the Korean War is that not a lot of people talk about it, even though it's technically still ongoing. You know, Korea is still a divided country. And I think a lot about what it means to be an American citizen and self-implicate my own identity when it comes to thinking about Korea. Because Korea historically has just been through so much. I mean, they went through a Japanese occupation and after the Japanese occupation, um, you know, we're basically like America and communist forces like, you know, Russia fought over this peninsula. Both had their own interests in mind. And whatever your feelings about the politics of that, it's what you, we can say for sure is that the you might argue that South Koreans weren't allowed to self-determine. Um, and that whole period of post-war Korea the treatment of women was so terrible and we have a whole, whole generations of Korean children who are basically exported as international adoptees through Christian agencies such as Holt. Um, and you know, it's, it's all wrapped up in globalization and capitalism and treatment of women, um, sex trafficking. Like there's just a lot there. So I, that's, I'm sorry if that's a really long no, answer, but that's super interesting stuff. I mean, I think if you ask anybody on the street to tell you what they know about the Korean war, you know, they would say like the U S army helped South Korea become independent. Right. I mean, like, like most of our history about the wars we've been involved in as a country, you know, it's all sugarcoated, but it's much more complicated than that. Right. And then that aftermath is what is particularly interesting, I think. Yeah, I just think, I I think that's so true. And, you know, I'm still learning every single day. Um, so I'm certainly not an expert. This is just something that I'm actively pursuing for myself and my writing. But I, I do think, you know, thinking about those post-war conditions, um, Korea was on a fast track to try to industrialize. And um, the money that they could have spent on like social infrastructure, like for women and children um, and for families who were in dire circumstances went, went to other things um, and adoption became the solution for that, which is how I got here basically. So it's, I think I, I think a lot about the causality of, of history in that way. Have you been to the DMZ? I have not. I lived in South Korea for two years, and so I made the like trip to the DMZ that everyone makes. I actually I didn't go to the area just north of Seoul where most people go. I went to like a smaller area in the northeast, but it was honestly one of the weirdest experiences of my life. I, I like wow. I, I expected it to be like a really somber place where people were like really thinking about and and coming to terms with the war and the fact that it is ongoing, which most people don't realize, but instead it was like this, although it was like highly policed and highly secure, it had become this weird, like capitalist tourist carnival area where people were like selling junk food and buying souvenirs and getting their photos taken, which is not at all what I expected. And so I don't know. It was, it was interesting. Like maybe that is a symptom of this like Western influence you're talking about. I don't know. Yeah, that's, that's wild. Um, 
that that's super wild. I yeah, I've never been to Korea and um I, I do really want to go. That is something that's very important to me. I'm really hoping that my research will take me there, hopefully through some funding of some kind. <laughs> Always be nice. But... <laughs> yeah, right. Well, I should say it's a beautiful country with amazing people and some of the best food I've ever had anywhere in the world. So it's a great place to visit. Um, but it does have a really interesting and complicated history that I can imagine would be really inspiring for anyone's writing really if they had a connection to the place so like as far as your process is concerned how do these themes find their way into your work is it something that you're like consciously writing about or are you surprised when some of these themes of abandonment and images or themes related to the korean war work their way into your work Mm. yeah i i feel like my process is still a mystery to me yeah. a little bit. Um, sometimes I will have a hard time sleeping and I will come downstairs and like sit in, in the sunroom in the house that I live in and I will just start writing. But I will say that I have actually willfully chosen not to write recently. Um, like there, I just went through a period this summer where I wasn't writing and I was like, you know what? I'm just going to take the pressure completely off. And I'm just not even going to think about it because I was so tired. I feel like I, I don't know if this has ever happened to you, Jared, but I just felt like I was writing the same thing over and over again. Like that I was stuck in a cycle of writing these like sad love poems. Oh, yeah. And and they weren't even bad. Like people liked them. They were getting published. But I didn't feel like it was representative of like what I really care about as a writer And so I decided I'm just going to stop for a while. And now my process has involved reading things that that have nothing to do with poetry. So I'm reading a lot of um, critical theory, reading about, I guess it it does have to do with poetry. Like I'm reading a lot about aesthetics, for example. um, But I'm just sort of feeding my brain different material. And I'm really, it's already starting to change the way I write. So I'm, I'm kind of excited for like a new chapter, honestly. Yeah. In what ways did you see like that break from writing affecting your writing afterwards? I I think that I just, well, I was talking to someone on our faculty um, who's amazing, Brian Teer. um, And he, I gave him a packet of poems and I just said to him, like, I haven't been writing. This is what I have. This is what I have written recently. And he was like, wow. Okay. Like, because he, he knows that I work very hard and that and I'm, I'm pretty prolific and I almost always have things I'm excited to show him. And um, I was excited about this last poem where I saw something different happening. And he said to me, your work has so much figurative language in it, so much metaphor. And this is just so different from what I've seen from you. You're just making observations. You're saying like this happened, this happened, this happened. And then you're ending with rhetoric, which is not a move I usually do. And my, the subject matter had absolutely nothing to do with being in love or being abandoned <laughs> or the DMZ or anything. Right, yeah. It had to do with the politics of the archive. So I don't know. It's it's weird. I don't really know where I'm going with this yet, but I'm just trusting in it. And part of that trust meant being okay with not writing this summer, which, yeah, felt like a to me a very like big act of, of self-trust because it is scary to think that you're, you know, you have this opportunity, you're being funded to write for three years, and you're just not going to write for three months. Right. I mean, you know, Yeah. so. So you asked me if that's ever happened to me, and it, it, it has. But for me, it was like, when I graduated from the MFA program. So like, I, I'm kind of the same as you, I I am kind of very religious with my writing. I try to write every single morning for a few hours. And I try to stick to that. And I am pretty good at sticking to that. But I graduated from the MFA program and I just, there was just like the next day I was like, the best thing I can do right now, I feel this in my bones. The best thing I can do right now is just take a break. I just have to get away from it. And like, I, and so I didn't write that whole summer after I graduated. And it just felt like after being in the MFA program and being kind of inundated with all of this information, all of the, these new ideas about craft And then also being in the pressure cooker of that final year and trying to finish the thesis, I felt like my writing process had changed in some way in which I was like almost distracted. I was thinking more about writing a great story instead of 
just exploring and playing and figuring the story out as I go in that first draft, which has always been the way that I write. And so my, my stories were coming out really kind of stale, really flat. And so I just needed to get away from it and, and get a break from it. And I'm still kind of working through that. I'm back to writing every day, but I'm still trying to get back to that original process. And, you know, I think I'm getting there, but it's, it's a process yeah. in and of itself, right? It's so true. And it's so frustrating when you're like, I know I'm a highly creative person. I know that if I just do this, that something will happen. But I mean, you know, I think it's so important to take those breaks. I'll mention Brian Tier again, because he's just always saying really wise things to me. He (laughs) said, uh, you know, sometimes the writing process, and I'm paraphrasing here, is just like a giant pile of compost. You know, and we think compost is so great. It's so good for the ecosystem. And you're just like throwing things on it. Right. And you're you're just reading this. You're doing that. You're building these habits. But compost is also like really gross and like all (laughs) kinds of crazy things are happening inside of it. And it's this whole little universe that's breaking down beneath the surface. And eventually that material becomes like the actual rich organic matter that can be directly put on something, you know, but yeah. it, it takes a while. And yeah. when you told me that I felt a lot better. Yeah. You, I guess trust the process and trust yourself. If you know, you feel like you need a break or you feel like you need to push through something. I feel like we get a lot of advice in these programs, but the thing is process is so hard to nail down. It's not the same for everybody. Right. So I feel like a lot of the advice that we get are really just suggestions. They're just things that have worked for other people. And that does not mean that they're going to work for us. Right. And we have to be aware of that and willing to like sift through that and just take the pieces that we need and listen to our own um, kind of instincts. So true. Yeah. People are always trying to give you writing advice and, (laughs) you know, it is just such an individual thing that you just have to push through yourself. So lately, you told me that your interests have moved a little beyond just poetry to the essay. You told me you love poets who are blending and defying genre and that you've been working on a lyric essay for the last half year or so. So what piqued your curiosity and motivated you to try this new genre? Well, actually, this really relates to what we were just talking about, which is I was tired of writing poems. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I wanted to write poems in a different way. I I wanted to experiment. And I was taking this eco-poetic feminism class, and I wanted to write an essay instead of a collection of poems. And of course, like the way the sections work in the essay, they are basically poems in a lot of of ways. But um, I guess I just the subject matter that I cared about required a different format. I lost a friend a few years to about two years ago now. Um, and part of my processing the grief of his loss was st- involved thinking back on my childhood and my adolescence, um, which is really when I knew him and thinking specifically about this lighthouse on the Island where I grew up. And one of the things that I remembered about the lighthouse was that there are always rabbits and foxes. And I, it was an ecology class, right? So I was thinking, I started thinking about the ecology of the islands and I became sort of obsessed with a few different subject matters. Like I I became fascinated with the European rabbits. I wanted to know how did they get there? Come to find out that the person who lived in the lighthouse wanted to have a year round source of food and to sell some pelts on the side. But in the process, the rabbits began kind of destroying the ecosystem. They started tunneling, they sped up the erosion. Um, it's off a whole chain of events, like with the other animal species in the area, because they began eating the natural grass. Anyway, I could go on and on everything connected in this crazy interconnected web of being right. But In a weird way, I started writing about the island to process this time in my life and specifically also not just to process the loss of my friend, but also to really process what it felt like to grow up as like one of the only people of color on that island. My friend who passed away was also a person of color and really just finally like thinking back on that time in my life and circling around it intellectually as a way to get to the true feelings beneath them. Right. Well, I'm sorry to hear about your friend. And I I guess that goes back to uh, what we were saying earlier about using writing as healing. And also it makes me think about just this idea of being flexible with ourselves. You know, like sometimes 
maybe you need a poem to work through something. Maybe it needs to be an essay another time. Maybe you start something and you think it's going to be about this one thing, but then it becomes about being a person of color on this island, right? So it's like, I think as emerging writers, we have to learn to like listen to that inner voice that's telling us, hey, you need this right now. And hey, this piece wants to be this and learn to listen to that and trust it instead of pushing against it or something. Yeah, absolutely. You know, it used to be that when I didn't know what to do, I'd just be like, I'll write a sonnet. But you know what? (laughs) Sometimes you just can't write a sonnet. Yeah. Like, you know, and I think that's what poets are always telling each other is like, oh, you just have to try a form, you know, here's a prompt. And sometimes you just have to figure out what it is you're trying to write about and understand that, you know, you got to find, make up the form yourself, perhaps. And sometimes you have to know that you just don't want to write a love poem. So it's not going to be a sonnet. <laughs> yeah, totally. Totally. No, no more sad love poems for me. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, let's talk a little bit about the MFA program. So you're currently in your second year in the University of Virginia's MFA in creative writing program, which is a three-year fully funded program that accepts four poets and four fiction writers each year. According to the website, students also have the option to graduate in two years on an accelerated schedule. Before we get into the details of the program itself, I wanted to talk a bit about your journey getting there because it wasn't a traditional one. So tell us about your path through academia and how you ended up in the MFA at UVA. Okay, yeah, it it definitely wasn't. uh, I did not take the traditional route. Um, I'm on the older end of things. Um, I think that there's a lot of variety in the MFA experience, but in my cohort, I'm the eldest. I'm 30, and most of them came here. Quite a few of them came basically right after out of undergrad. For me, I did start off somewhat traditional. I, I so I grew up on that island I told you about, but my parents ended up going bankrupt, and we had to move um, when I was a senior in high school. We moved pretty much the middle of nowhere, Minnesota. Like it was a housing development that had gone under. So there were just like all of these little houses that looked the same, but we were like one of two families that lived there. It was a wild time. And I got, ended up getting in, it ended up being a good thing because I got into this public arts high school called Purpich Center for the Arts, um, right outside of Minneapolis. And that was where I fell in love with poetry. Um, I studied with um, a poet named John Colburn Another poet I love um, taught there, um, her name is Sun Young Shin. I didn't get to study with her while I was there, but I'm a great, I'm a great admirer of her work now. And um, from there, I, I did go straight to college. I went to Sarah Lawrence College for a year and a half. And, you know, I, I got to take a workshop with Heather Crystal. That was very formative for me. But I just struggled financially a lot. It just wasn't going to be something that was going to pan out for me without taking out an exorbitant amount of loans. And I was already, already aware of that to the point, just because I was like living in a not so great part of town. I was hungry all the time. Like I was like, I can't keep doing this. And I just dropped out and I dropped out for a very long time, like five or six years. And I I moved to Seattle and kind of just lived my life for a while. And and writing became like a private practice for myself that I didn't share with other people, but that was meaningful to me. And eventually I I went back to community college because I don't, I don't know what it's like in most States, but in Washington state, if you are over 26, it's practically free to go. They might, they'll even give you like Pell grants and things. And um, so I, I got my AA, I transferred to Gonzaga university um, on a scholarship and met the poet Todd Marshall, who's a former Washington State Poet Laureate, and he told me about MFA programs. And I was like, that's wild. Excuse <laughs> me, they will pay you to just hang out and write poems and talk to other artists for like two or three years. I felt like this has to be a scam of some kind. I don't know what it is that it, you know, what it is, but I, I yeah, I basically... I applied and I treated it like the lottery. I had no expectations. I kind of felt like I had things going against me. I knew I was applying in the same group of people who like went to Harvard and, you know, Berkeley and things like that. And that I went to like community college. My transcript looks so weird, probably to people. (laughs) Yeah. I just had no expectations and I was really 
like obviously so happy and excited when I, when I did get into UVA. So how do you think that journey has affected the writer and the MFA student that you are now? Um, I think the biggest thing I can say is that I do not take any of this for granted. You know, having worked for a very long time in the service industry, um, having struggled, like having, having been um, in precarious economical situations. I mean, I'm still in a precarious economical situation. It's just a little more stable because I have funding and health insurance. Right. But, um, you know, we're not exactly rolling in it as MFA students. Right. <laughs> um, but, but that journey makes it so that I really don't take any of this for granted. And um, I... I, I really am trying to make the most of my time here. I'm, t- I'm taking classes outside of my department next semester. I'm trying to get more involved in the program than just taking classes by being involved with Meridian. And, you know, I know what it's like to be a writer and not be surrounded by writer, other writers. It's, it's very lonely and it's very difficult um, when you're writing poems and honestly, no one gives a fuck. <laughs> like, you know, um, it's, I, I imagine it, you know, you, I don't know if you have a similar experience like pre MFA or post graduation, but if you don't have that community of people to share with and you're not hearing their work and you're not, you don't have someone to talk about like, Oh my gosh, I just ordered this book by Victoria Chang. It's so great. Let me tell you about it. It, it starts to feel very alienating if that's something that really matters to you. So I remember what that was like, and I don't want to go back to it. And this program has given me a community. Right. Yeah. I can point to like specific people in my life who along the way I met and who were artists or writers who encouraged me to keep doing this thing that I was kind of doing sporadically and in private and not getting any feedback on. And it was like those people who kind of gave me little boosts along the way that eventually, you know, led to the MFA program. So it is really important to have like those influences in that community, I think. Yeah, absolutely. You you mentioned that working class background. And one thing you told me before the interview was that, that you've found navigating higher academia a bit challenging in some ways coming from that background. So what have you found the most difficult one lesson that I've learned is that there's always funding. It's just hidden away and you have to know who to ask for it and you know have to know how to get it. And I think some of this like comes easier for people in my cohort because they have parents who are academics. So they have an idea of like how to navigate that system a little bit better. Whereas for me, I just, it, all of it was pretty, pretty wild and new. Um, yeah, my, my parents are educated. I mean, my, my dad did some college and my mom is an occupational therapist. Um, but this is just a whole, it was a whole new world getting into this program. And um, in order to be competitive, like to con- continue to be competitive in this sort of environment, you have to be applying for grants and fellowships and workshops and you have to be reading your email, which I find is like really, really difficult to be doing 100% all the time. Um, there's so many of them. And you never know if it's just some inane bullshit or if it's like actually like if you scroll all the way to the bottom, there's this tiny note about travel funding. You know, it's right, right. It's difficult um, if you've not been in it before. Something that I experienced that I think a lot of people experience when they get into an MFA program, especially if like they've been out of school for a long time or they come from a certain kind of background is imposter syndrome. And I feel like I experienced that pretty terribly from the entirety of my first year. It was wild to me because uh, even though, um, you know, I have some publications and I had the encouragement of my peers and um, my mentors, I just sort of felt like I can't believe they let me in. Is this some kind of mistake, you know? I didn't have that traditional path. So it just sort of felt like um, I felt like the weirdo in the group a little bit, to be honest. So how did you work through that? You know, I just decided that I did belong here. And part of, part of that meant being more social and um, getting to know everyone. Um, I, I'm in school with such amazing writers and just they're the kindest people. Um But I think we were all scared of each other at first. You know, we all came from all over the country and we're just like, 
put together in this program and we're all just in Charlottesville, Virginia. And for most of us, it was a brand new experience. Like some of us had never even been here before. And it just took us a while to trust, you know, and workshop does not always help that because you're trying to get to know each other, but the first task is to critique each other's work. So it's a difficult place, but I think I worked through that by making, making some really good friends. And um, also by just trusting that like I knew what I was doing before I got here and whatever happens that I am a writer, I am a poet and I'm going to keep writing. And if I focus too much on seeking the validation of other people that I'm always going to be playing that game. So we've talked about how you've kind of crossed genres going from poetry, trying out writing essays. And um, you just mentioned that you're going to be taking a class outside of your department soon. So it sounds like there's a lot of academic flexibility in this program. So what have been the benefits of that flexibility for you and your fellow MFA students, you think? You know, I, I think one thing that's so amazing is um, – I believe that this is changing in the program, but my first year, it was completely just a fellowship year where I didn't have to teach at all. And a lot of people during that first year take advantage and take classes outside of the department. And it does feed their writing um, very much. So people will take um, Jewish studies classes. um, They'll take They'll take an essay writing course with like Jane Allison, who's on the fiction side, for example. Um, like there, there's a lot of cross crossing of genres during that time. I'm trying to take a class right now um, on Marxist forms. <laughs> it's like a it's like an applied theory class, and I think it's really great because not only will those that those subjects that you care about, whether it's like taking a German course or a history course or whatever it is, like, well, that'll feed your own intellect and like the things that inspire you and interest you and will probably ultimately feed your writing. But not only that, it does set you up if you do want to pursue a PhD of some kind after the program. It's a really good way to get a feeling of like what other academic subjects are out there, you know, a chance to write a seminar paper because, you know, some people after the MFA might just be like, I am done with school, thanks. But but many of us do go on, you know, like many of us in this program have gone on to pursue PhDs or MAs, et cetera, afterwards. So it sounds like you've had the opportunity to build a bit of community amongst the other students in the program. I was curious to hear also about the community between the students and the faculty. It sounds like the faculty to student ratio is pretty high at UVA, which tends to be a good thing. So have you felt like you've had a good relationship with your professors? Absolutely. 100%. Um, I feel so lucky. Uh, Yeah. um, Right now we're taking, Brian Tier is teaching um, like a class on uh, that where we're learning how to typeset uh, letterpress we're, we're printing our poems, we're writing Renga together, um, we're learning how to bind chat books. It's a totally different way to do workshop that I've never experienced before. And honestly, it's like really brought us together, like not having a traditional workshop for one of the semesters. And last spring, we had a workshop with Rita Dove that just totally blew my mind. I mean, that woman like goes without saying like she is just so wise, like not even just with like her advice about how to revise poems, but just her life advice. Um, just a really kind person. Lisa Raspar is teaching an awesome class right now on lyric sequence. And she is always just recommending the best books. I mean, they, they really care about us. Um, Kiki Petrosina is on leave right now. She's also amazing. I worked with her a lot on my docu poetry projects last year. And I mean, she had such a huge impact on that. But the point being that they're all really invested in us as a group, but also many of them, even though they're insanely busy, are available to me like during office hours. And that's the time I find that in the program. The workshops are great. The classes are awesome. But having the ability to like have a real conversation with them and bring in some poems um, has like definitely changed my writing for the better. And you mentioned earlier that you're teaching now. According to the website, um, MFA students who teach get to design and teach their own creative writing classes. So I'm curious if that's what you're doing. And if so, have you gotten to like steal some things from your professors and implement them in your own class? 
Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, I've learned so much from them. I'm like, oh, that's a great poem. I'm teaching that for <laughs> sure. <laughs> you know, um, yeah, I've learned so much from them about how to talk about craft too, because, you know, before an MFA, before I was here at the MFA, I would write and I just think sort of, I did them things intuitively, but now I feel like I actually have a language to talk about craft elements. Um, I actually know what a seizure is now, for example, did not know that before. Yeah, they've really gifted me with a language to talk about poems in a way I didn't before. And teaching the class um, has been so inspiring. My my students are incredibly thoughtful and talented. Sometimes they're a little quiet, (laughs) but I also remember being very quiet when I was an undergrad. I wish they spoke spoke more freely because they're so, so smart. But it has been a real joy to be able to design my own class. I have a lot of freedom. Um, of course, my you know my advisor came and observed. Uh, you know, I, I had to submit my syllabus. It's not like I'm just out here standing on desks and like <laughs> having us play a game and right. you know doing whatever I want. I, I definitely I took a huge part of my summer to try to plan the best course that I could. And then beyond teaching, you're also working at the literary magazine Meridian, which is published through the university. So what's that experience been like? And and what could you tell listeners about the editor side of the business? It is such a privilege to have a position like that, where you're reading other people's work, and you're creating this object that will be in the world for other people to look at. So I will say first, it's very much a privilege and I don't take that lightly. Um, I take it very seriously, which means that while I know that I have my own personal taste and aesthetics, um, it's really important to me that that pieces get read by more than one person for sure. And that we have a real conversation about them. And it's hard, you know, especially I'm sure many of the people listening and, and, and you can probably relate where it's, it hurts to be rejected. And then it feels so amazing to get an acceptance. And one thing I can say that I've learned from this experience is that sometimes it's relative, it's just almost arbitrary. And I, that sounds so um, negative. What, what I mean by arbitrary to clarify is that we get so many good poems, so many good poems. And it's hard to say no to a good poem, but you only have so much space. And you're thinking also about how the poems are going to interact like the poems, the stories, the essays, how they're all going to interact together in one one journal. You're thinking about like theme and content, you know. Um, it's just really hard making those calls and sometimes I really struggle with it. But my my team is so awesome. Um, and last year it was my friend Jetty who was the editor-in-chief and he was amazing. And I learned a lot from him on how to think about equity how to make these choices and also delegate and trust that the other genre editors are going to make the right calls and being okay with the fact that unfortunately can't say yes to everything, which for me is difficult because it, it's just that, you know, we all know how that feels to, yeah. to get a no. Um, I also worked on a, at a literary magazine when I was in the MFA program and I did not realize before doing it just how much it was going to help me to see it from the other side and to read other people's work and to see how those decisions are made and to know like when the rejection comes in, it's like, okay, well, you know, that doesn't mean this is a bad story. It just means like maybe they didn't have space for it. Maybe it didn't fit into the issue they had. Maybe they just had a ton of great stories this time, you know, so yeah. it's, it's really beneficial, I think, to see the business from the other side if you get the opportunity to do that yeah i mean it's wild you know you see like wow there are these many submissions this is what my poem could be competing against i mean you know it's and we we do publish people who have never published something before too like it's you know so it's you just never know what's gonna happen but it is really amazing to be able to read so much work and see what people are thinking about So there was one other thing I wanted to ask you about because it's kind of unique. I haven't seen this in other MFA programs, but I mentioned it earlier that apparently the UVA MFA program allows students to finish in two years instead of three if they want to. I was just curious if you knew anything about that, if you knew people who had taken that route and like what that entails. Yeah, I mean, it's absolutely possible to do. Someone in my cohort just um, decided to do that, actually. And uh, I know that a lot of people who had careers or families, like before they got into the program, like that's the route that they decided to, 
to take. And um, essentially it's, yeah, it's accelerated. It means that let's say that I decided to do that route. Um, I would have to be sending in a copy of my thesis, like literally right now, like ideally a week ago to have to be perused through for my, my readers, you know, my advisor, my first and my second reader. And then I would be submitting another copy. I want to say in spring, like early spring, and then you would be defending your thesis, like with the third year. So it's, you know, I suppose, um, it's just the extra stress of like, not only are you teaching for the first time, but you're also writing a whole book um, before you graduate. So it's a lot, but people do it. Um, really motivated people do it. Yeah. I assume you're taking more classes per semester too. Um, yeah, you have to. So every semester you have to take a workshop and you have to take a forms class. Um, that forms class can be replaced by another class that um, is a graduate level class if you make the argument that it's important to your work. But you do have to have a certain number of credits to be able to graduate. So it's really hard. Like most people who decide to do that two year route, like they've planned for it. Yeah, right. Um, yeah. And and it's still possible, you know, I think to otherwise to, to do it still. But it's just, it's very stressful. <laughs> so I'm very impressed that my friend's doing it. Well, Caitlin, this has been awesome talking to you. Before we go, I just wanted to ask one last thing, which is what is one way in which the MFA experience has been different for better or for worse from your expectations when applying? I think one thing that I'll say is that it was so competitive to get into the program and I struggled a lot before I came back to school. I wasn't expense I wasn't expecting to find a community that was so incredibly supportive. Um and to I, I suspected that I was going to make friends here, but um I think I just didn't even realize how badly I needed friends who are also creative, um, who could like understand like my passion in a certain way. Granted, I will say some days it's nice not to talk to poets. <laughs> like, you know, I, you, it's like you talk about it all day. You're like, okay, I'm, I'm done talking about that. But, um, but I guess what I'll say is like, I expected the program to be extremely competitive. And like, you know, I, I was like, what if it's like weirdly cutthroat or, you know, the teachers like pin us against each other. Or like, I don't know. I think I was like conjuring this idea of like old school Iowa or something in my head. You know, you hear these horror stories and it's not been anything like that at all. Um, it's been very positive for sure. And I just think like people are just competing with themselves. They're not competing with each other. And a big part of that is because UVA, it's very important to UVA that we all get the same funding. And because of that, I think we're all just trying to do our own thing and support each other. And it doesn't feel as competitive as maybe I expected when I was applying and thinking, trying to imagine what it would be like to be in graduate school. Well, I'm glad it's been better than your expectations. And I'm glad you came on the show and talked to me. This has been so fun. Thanks again. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me. It's been a really lovely conversation. Thank you.